the famous mathematician Paul Erdős, liked to imagine that there is a book containing all beautiful mathematical proofs. He simply called it the book. And when he saw a particularly elegant proof, he said that it was straight from the book. As computer scientists, we know very well that there is another volume of the book containing beautiful algorithms. And this video is about one of them. To understand this video, you don't need to know anything about algorithms or programming. We just need to explain what computer scientists and programmers mean when they talk about trees. By a tree, we mean a bunch of objects that we call nodes, some of which are connected, similar to the branches of a real tree. This means that in a tree, you can walk from any node to any other node using the connections between them, but there is always just one way of doing that. So if we add a connection between these two red nodes here, it stops being a tree because now there are two possible paths between the two nodes. And if we remove a connection between these two blue nodes, they cannot reach each other anymore. So this again is not a tree. Once you know what a tree is, you'll start seeing them pretty much everywhere. For example, this is a small part of the file system tree on my computer. The nodes are the folders, and there are connections between each folder and its subfolders. On the right, you can see another visualization of the same tree that might be more familiar to you. These are just two different ways of showing the same tree. You may be surprised to learn that there are trees even in biology. This one shows how certain bacteria are related to one another. The outer nodes, green in the picture, correspond to actual bacteria and the tree connecting them shows how they are related. So if two species are similar, they are also close to one another in the tree. When you get your hands on a tree that's so large that you can't just view it, like the full file system tree which can have millions of nodes, you would like to know at least some of its basic properties. The first question you might ask is, how big is it? That's easy to answer, you can just count the number of nodes in the tree. But the next question you could ask, which is already much more interesting, is how long is it? To answer this question, we want to find the longest possible path in the tree. Its length is also called the diameter of the tree. For example, in the bacteria tree, this is a longest path. Notice I said a longest path and not the longest path. Because there could be other paths that have the same length, for instance the blue one here. What matters is, no path is longer. In small trees, like my example file system tree, you can find the diameter just by eyeballing. Here we just see that it's 4. But how would you find the diameter of the bacteria tree, for instance? Well, of course, now we've already shown you what the longest path is. But if you didn't know that, to compute the answer for this one, we already need a recipe or an algorithm to do it. Then we can write the algorithm down as a computer program and have the computer find the answer for us. So how do we find the diameter? Here's one simple solution. We start by picking some node. Then we gradually compute the distances from it to all other nodes in the tree. How do we go about this? Well, it's clear that the neighbors of the original node must have distance 1 from it. So let's write that down. And then we look at the neighbors of the neighbors and mark them as having distance 2. And so on and so on until we compute all the distances. This procedure is also called breadth-first search. So now if we look at the largest number that we have here, it corresponds to the length of the longest path starting in the original node. So that would be one candidate for the longest path. But of course, there could be even longer paths that start in different nodes. So we simply iterate over all nodes of our tree and we compute the distances from each one in the same way. 
This would of course take a while, so let's skip to the end. So finally out of all of these numbers that we wrote down, we take the largest one, which is 9 in our case. And this largest number is the diameter of our tree. So how fast is this algorithm? We can actually make a simple calculation to guess how long it would run. Let's say our tree has n nodes. Then to find the longest path from one node, the computer needs to do roughly n operations when computing the distances to the other nodes. And you have to do this computation n times, once for each starting node. So the overall number of operations you need to do is roughly n squared. And that's perfectly fine if you want to compute the diameter of this example tree or of the bacteria tree. But what if we try to use it to compute the diameter of the full file system? Well, it has roughly a million nodes, so let's say n equals 1 million. Then the number of operations we need to do is roughly a million of millions, which corresponds to hours or even days of running time. And who would have the time for that? Fortunately, there is a much faster algorithm whose number of operations is something like 2n, which is much better than n squared when n is large. For instance, on the file system tree, it would be done in mere seconds. Here's how it works. We start by picking one node in our tree. It doesn't really matter which one. Let's call it A. Next, we find the distances from A to all of the other nodes, just like we did before. Then, we take one of the nodes that have the biggest possible distance from our starting node A. Let's call this one B. And then we do the same thing. We again compute the distance from B to all the other nodes. And now we take some longest path from B and we're done. That's it. That's the result of the algorithm. And it really is a longest path in the whole tree. I want to stress how surprising it is that this algorithm actually works. It doesn't matter which node you start with, but it still gives you the correct answer. For example, this time let's choose a different node as our A. Then we find some farthest node B. And again the farthest node from B. And we get a different longest path. This algorithm is of course much faster than the previous one, since the number of steps we made is only roughly 2 times n. At this point you're probably wondering, why does the algorithm work? It turns out there's a really cool physical intuition about the algorithm, and trees in general, that we know from this great book by Michal Foryshek and Monika Steinova. And with that intuition, everything will start to make perfect sense. So, imagine that the whole tree is made of beads connected by strings of the same length. Well, you don't have to imagine it, because we actually made this model. Now, let's look at the algorithm again, this time with beads. First, I take an arbitrary bead in my model, this is the node A, and I hang the model by this bead. You can see that the gravity helps me here to find the distances to other nodes. You can see how the beads are forming levels by their distance to the top node. These are the same levels that we found with our breadth first search method. This means that the furthest nodes are exactly those in the lowest level. I continue by taking one of these nodes. Say this will be our node B. And then I hang the model one more time from B. I again take one of the lowest nodes, grab it, and voila! This path I'm holding is what the algorithm says is one of the, possibly multiple, longest paths in the tree. Okay, but so far we only saw a different way of visualizing the same old algorithm. But maybe you've noticed how the nodes of the tree now look suspiciously like a triangle. That's a great observation and, and pretty much the key to this mystery. Because you could actually see this triangle if we held the tree by any longest path. To demonstrate, let me choose a different longest path in our tree. I will put the tree back and choose another path of length 9 in it. Say this one. And as you can see, we can again see the triangle for this completely unrelated longest path specifically by 
triangle, I mean, if you look at some node on the top path, whose distance to the end of the path is, let's say, 3, then the nodes below it fall only at most to the same depth, 3 in this case. And this holds in general, but why? Now, that just follows from the fact that we chose the top path to be the longest one. Because if there were a node outside the triangle, for example here in depth 4, then this path would actually be longer than the top path. But we assume that the top path is the longest one, so we get a contradiction. This can't happen, and therefore, triangle. And now, the algorithm itself. Let's look one final time at what the algorithm is actually doing. We start by picking any node, say this one, as the node A. But this time, let's keep hanging the tree by the chosen longest path, instead of rehanging it from A, and try to understand what the algorithm is doing. Let me stress that the algorithm knows nothing about the top path. We hold the tree in this way only because it helps us understand what the algorithm is up to. So recall that we started by finding some node farthest away from A. Let's think about where this farthest node can be. We start computing distances from A to other nodes. Let's pause the algorithm now, when we've just reached the top path for the first time. From this point onwards, we can nicely visualize the order in which we are exploring the nodes. As you can see, they are contained in larger and larger triangles. The only exception are the nodes in this branch that we may reach even sooner. Well, this means that the nodes that we reach the last, and so are the farthest, are all on the right edge of our big triangle. In other words, the node B, where we end up in the first part of our algorithm, is some node on the right edge of our triangle. In fact, any of these nodes can be chosen as B, as they all have the same distance from A. Well, but now we are almost done, because in the second step of the algorithm, we do the exact same thing, and hence, this time, the farthest node must be somewhere on the left side. If you now look at the path that we found, you can see that its length is the same as the length of the top path, which means that our algorithm really did find a longest path. And that finishes the proof! Ta-da! Okay, there is one issue that we kind of swept under the rug. Namely, if the diameter of the tree is even, then the triangle looks like this. The nodes at the bottom are now both on the left edge and on the right edge of the triangle. Our proof still works, we just need to be a bit more careful, because the found longest path could also look like this. So, to recap. In this video we saw how to compute the diameter of a tree with a fast and also pretty cool algorithm. The best part is that there are quite a few other facts that follow directly from the triangle picture. For example, in any tree, all of its longest paths need to go through the green rectangle in the middle of the top edge of the triangle. And even more, the nodes in the rectangle are right in the middle of any longest path. We will not cover these other facts in this video, but you can look in the video description to see what else the triangle picture tells us about trees and more interesting connections. For me, this video nicely shows why you should care about algorithms, even if you are mainly interested in mathematics. It was because of our care about efficiency that we arrived at this pretty elegant algorithm and ultimately, we got a new way of looking at trees. And that leads to new insights that we may not have had otherwise. Finally, we would like to thank 3Blue1Brown and Leo Soas for inspiring us to create this video, the Manim community, and to several other people who helped us in various ways.